Good morning, online campus. Pastor Steve Garcia here. So glad that you're with us. Let us know in the comments where you're watching from so that we could interact with you this morning. Have you ever worn the wrong shoes and paid the price? I think every one of us has a story in which we picked the wrong shoes and destroyed our feet. I remember a couple of years ago, I needed to buy some new shoes, and so I researched on the internet and found some that were, were said to be so comfortable, you don't even need socks. Sounded great to me, so I ordered them, and when they arrived, I decided I wanted to break them in by going on a walk with my wife, and so I put them on without socks, and off we went. About 10 minutes in, I couldn't take another step. My feet hurt so bad. I felt like I was walking in a couple of pieces of Tupperware. I mean, these things ripped open the back of my heels. I had blisters all over my toes. I literally pulled these things off my feet and finished the walk barefoot. Here I am, tiptoeing across the ground all gingerly, looking like I'm auditioning for a ballet. I mean, these were the worst shoes. Never underestimate the importance of good footwear. Those of you who work in the food service industry have to wear special shoes that prevent you from slipping. Those of you who work on construction sites have to wear boots with thick soles and steel toes. Those of you who like to work out need shoes that are light and comfortable so that they could absorb the shock of the exercise. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, I was in Kenya, Africa, and we met this man from the famous African Maasai tribes. These guys are used a lot in the promotion to tourists of, of an Africa vacation. These are the guys who are warriors. They like to jump up and down. Anyway, this man hiked to Kenya from Tanzania. That's over 1,500 miles. You want to know what kind of footwear he had? Take a closer look. You see these shoes? You know what they're made out of? Motorcycle tires. He said these shoes will last him about 20 to 25 years. Yeah, if you're gonna hike 1,500 miles, I think you need some good shoes. It's important that we never underestimate good shoes. And today, we're gonna talk about footwear, specifically what the Bible has to say about wearing the right kind of shoes so that we could step onto the battlefield. Today, we, we continue with part four of our message series about spiritual warfare that we're calling Battle Ready. And in the New Testament book of Ephesians chapter six, the apostle Paul implores Christians to wake up and step into the real battle. This is what he says in Ephesians 6, 11. He says, put on the full armor of God so that you could take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. What Paul is saying is that our enemy is not a physical one, it is a spiritual one. It is Satan and his legions of darkness. And, and if we think that all of the struggles, all of the battles that we have in this life are merely physical, we're actually missing it. We're in the wrong fight. The real fight is in the spiritual. The Apostle Paul was an interesting guy. He was someone who, who traveled all over the Roman Empire preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. He went to Jewish areas, Greek areas, Asian areas. And he would, he would tell people his own story of how Jesus transformed him from an enemy of Christ to an evangelist for Christ. And he planted many churches and many people gave their lives to Jesus, but many didn't. Many were angry with him. Many fought against him. And after a while, all that preaching about Jesus finally caught up with Paul and he was arrested. And he was shipped off to Rome and brought before the governor Felix. And this was the sentence that Paul received. Acts 24, 23. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. Paul was put under house arrest. The good news was that he got to receive visitors. The bad news is that he was chained to a Roman soldier every single day. And because Paul was a high profile guy, it wasn't just any Roman soldier, it was a Roman centurion. That means that this soldier was over a hundred other soldiers. 
And so day after day, Paul would see this Roman soldier. In fact, uh, at the end of the book of Ephesians, when Paul was concluding his talk about spiritual warfare, he said this, verse 19, pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. This is the context in which the book of Ephesians was written. Paul was chained to a Roman soldier. Day after day, he looked at this man. And I wonder if somewhere along the way, Paul thought, you know, this soldier that I'm chained to is battle ready. I mean, look at his belt. Look at his breastplate. Look at his shoes. Look at his shield. Look at his helmet. Look at his sword. Maybe Paul got to thinking, if only Christians were as battle ready as this Roman soldier. And just like that, Paul's imagination was captured and this soldier became the unwilling example of spiritual warfare to you and I all these thousands of years later. So I want you to imagine Paul looking down at the soldier on the other end of that chain as he penned these words in Ephesians 6 verse 14. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The apostle Paul implored Christians everywhere to take a page from the Roman Empire and to suit up with armor, but not the armor of men, the armor of God. And so he broke it down for us. He said, put on the belt of truth. Putting on the belt of truth means following the way of Jesus, who was the truth. And he said, put on the breastplate of righteousness. This is what we talked about last week. The breastplate guards our heart against enemy attack, but it also helps us to live righteously so we could take the attack to the enemy. Then he says to put on the boots of peace. That will be our topic for today. Next week, we'll talk about the shield of faith, followed by the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. Now, Paul says we are to wear all of these pieces together, the full armor, and when we do that, then we are battle ready. But even so, each of these pieces individually possess great power for the follower of Jesus. And so today, our focus is gonna be on the boots of peace. So let's break this down a little bit. The Roman soldiers changed the game when it came to footwear for battle. See, what they did was they fitted their shoes with spikes. They called them hobnails. Our modern context would be uh, cleats worn by a soccer player or a football player, for example. And these shoes allowed the Roman soldiers to get better footing when the initial onslaught of the enemy hit. Now, back in those days, battles would start with a huge clash. You've, you've seen it in movies before, movies like Braveheart or Lord of the Rings, where you have one army on one side, the other army on the other side, and some guy with face paint starts yelling, and then they all come and clash in the middle. And that's where the initial push begins. And one army tries to push the other one back. And because these Roman soldiers had hobnails in their shoes, they were able to stand their ground and withstand the initial onslaught of the enemy. And Paul is saying to Christians, these are the kind of boots you need too. But not just any boots, he says, boots of peace, feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. What is the kind of peace Paul is talking about? Well, he's talking about peace with God. Now, this seems like an odd use of terms. He's saying the way to war, wage war on the enemy is to wage peace. Those things seem contradictory. Well, it's important to understand who our enemy is. This is how the apostle Peter described Satan in 1 Peter 5.8. He said, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, I was in Africa and literally saw a roaring lion. And the lion I saw was roaring quietly. And that was terrifying to hear by itself. 
I can't imagine how overcome I would be with terror if I heard a lion roaring at its loudest. But the reason why the lion roars is that when it does, the animals scatter. They start running in every direction in a chaotic frenzy. And this is one of the schemes of the enemy. He wants to create chaos and disorder and frenzy so that we'll run all about and then he could pick us off and devour us. And that's why we have to bring peace onto the battlefield. Because when that lion roars, we'll be able to stand our ground, we won't lose our heads, we won't run off, but we'll be able to bring peace to the enemy. That's how you defeat the roaring lion. Satan can't stand peace. So how do we get this kind of peace? What does it look like to put on the boots of peace? Well, I wanna give you a couple of practical ways to do that, but here is the starting point. This is absolutely number one on how to put on the, the boots of peace. Number one, receive God's peace. The bad news is we can't get the peace with God on our own. The good news is Jesus gifts us peace with God for free. We need only to reach out and receive it. The Apostle Paul tells us how to get peace with God. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1, this is what he says. Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The only way to have peace with God is through faith in Jesus. Many people believe, however, that peace with God is our default position. We're born innocent. We're, we're always at peace with God. Maybe you've even heard somebody say, we're all just children of God. That sounds nice, it's just not biblical. Again, Paul agreed with the fact that we are all children, just not children of God. Listen to how he said in Ephesians chapter two. He said, we were by nature children of wrath, <laughs> not children of God. We were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Grace simply means an undeserved gift. And Jesus is saying, I am giving you this gift, not because you earned it, not because you deserve it, but simply because I love you. I am providing for you this gift that leads to peace with God. You just need to receive it. Have you ever been in a situation where somebody brought you a gift and you just had a really hard time accepting it? You know, maybe they tried to pick up the check at a restaurant, or maybe they brought you something big on your birthday and you looked at it and you said, I can't take this. This is, this is too expensive. I don't deserve this. I cannot accept it. What does the gift giver usually say? Well, if they're a really close friend, they might say to you, would you shut up and take the gift? I love to give gifts. I want to do this for you. I love you. Just receive the gift. And this is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, I love you. And because of your sin, you are not at peace with God. But I'm laying my life down on a cross to absorb all of the sin. God treated Jesus with all of the wrath of sin so that we wouldn't have to feel that wrath. Jesus paid for it in full. And by placing our faith in him, we receive this gift of peace for free because Jesus picked up the tab. And he's saying, why won't you receive this? He, he, he gift wrapped it. He put it under the tree. And sadly, so many of us walk past that gift every single day. And we don't even realize that this gift that's sitting there is the gift of the forgiveness of sins. It is the gift of the security of my future. It is the gift of the power of God in me. It is the gift of my transformation from child of wrath to child of God. It is the gift of 
peace with Almighty God. Who wouldn't receive this? And herein lies the spiritual war. Satan sees Jesus offering us this free gift of peace with God through faith in Christ, and he amasses his army and begins his onslaught. So here comes the temptation. Come on, give in to your appetite. You don't need to follow Jesus. You don't need to be in that restrictive world. Have a little fun. Here comes the distraction. Come on, look at your phones. Look at everybody else. Compare yourself to others. Just don't look at Jesus. Here comes the accusation. You don't deserve this. You're a mess up. You're a failure. You're too far gone. And the enemy starts driving us backwards, further and further to the edge of the cliff. And this is the moment where we need to strap on the boots of peace by crying out to heaven and say, Jesus, I receive this gift of peace. I place my faith in you. I give you my life. And when you pray that, that's the moment that Jesus transfers you to the winning team. That's the moment your shoes reach down with its hobnails and dig into the soil so that you could withstand the onslaught of the enemy. But it's only through faith in Christ. The way to receive peace with God is to receive it by faith. That is absolutely our starting point. How do you put on the boots of peace? Number one, receive God's peace. Here's the second, remember God's peace. Have you ever been in a situation that was chaotic, difficult, or stressful, and you, your mind just went totally blank? I cannot tell you how many times my mind has been cluttered with so many things and I walk out of my office, out to the parking lot, I get to my car and realize that all of my keys are in the building that just locked behind me. <laughs> and I'm running around, hey, can I borrow your keys? I cannot tell you how many times my mind was, was clouded with a million things to the point where I drove right past my exit off the freeway. I mean, you've experienced this. I mean, how many times have you left your house in the morning only later to discover that you forgot to put on deodorant <laughs> or you forgot to brush your teeth or you forgot to change out of your flip-flops? Here you are working at a bank <laughs> in flip-flops, right? We've all been there that when life gets chaotic, we forget. And this is absolutely one of the schemes of the enemy. He loves to create chaos and disorder in your life so that you will forget who God is and the peace he's made available to you. Maybe today you're, you're struggling and you really need peace. I love how the prophet Isaiah says it in Isaiah 26.3. He says, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Isaiah says, if we will remember God, we'll experience perfect peace. His words were, were, be steadfast, keep your thoughts fixed on him, remember him. What are the things you need to remind yourself about God in the midst of your struggles? Maybe today you're, you're struggling with sadness, uh, depression, feeling like there's nothing left to live for. Remember this, Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep trusting in him and he will fill you with so much peace to the point where your hope will be overflowing. Maybe today you're struggling with so-called Christians who are gossiping and, and being divisive and it's got you all twisted up. Remember this. 1 Corinthians 14, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Don't listen to divisive people. They're not of God. God is a God who brings you peace. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 addresses the person who's really struggling with anxiety, whose mind is running wild with all of the worst case scenarios. Paul says this, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. 
there is a crazy kind of peace that is available to you. A peace that doesn't even make sense, but God makes it available through Jesus Christ when we keep coming to him with our prayers. And it will guard heart and mind. You know, maybe today you're just struggling with with all of the bad news in the world. You're just feeling overwhelmed by, by all of these things happening. War, inflation, immorality, mass shootings, political agendas, and it's just so much, you can't take it anymore. Remember these words of Jesus. He said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Many of you have committed that verse to memory, but don't even realize that's the second part of what Jesus said. Here's the first part. Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus already won the war, and that ought to bring you peace in the battle. We must remember these key truths about God and it will bring our hearts perfect peace. Do what it takes to remind yourself of these things. Maybe you need to write some of these verses down and, and put them on the dashboard of your car or in the corner of your mirror or a sticky note on your laptop. Listen to music that affirms these kind of truths. Fill your cars and your homes and your headphones with worship songs that remind you of who God is so that your heart may experience peace. See, once you receive peace with God, you receive the peace of God. But that needs to be activated in your minds. Remember God's peace. That's the second way we could put on the boots of peace. The first way is receive God's peace. The second is remember God's peace. Here's the third, relay God's peace. What do you think of when you hear the word relay? Maybe a relay race? You know how it works. One runner completes their distance and they hand the baton to the next runner. They relay. The word relay literally means to carry forward. And this is what the command is to Christians everywhere, to bring the gospel forward, to carry it forward. Let's go back to Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14. He said, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. The word gospel simply means good news. Paul says when you are putting on the boots of peace, you're actually readying yourself to share this gospel of peace with others. You see, the boots of peace are both a defensive weapon and an offensive weapon. They're defensive in that they help us stand our ground, but they're offensive in that they, they help us to traverse over the harsh terrain to advance forward. These kinds of boots were necessary for Roman soldiers to walk over the harsh terrain. And this is what Christians are called to do. We are to, to traverse over the jagged rocks of fear. We are to tra traverse over the, the sloggy muds of doubt. We are to traverse over the hot sands of indifference and be ready to share the gospel, the good news of peace with others. The apostle Peter, another apostle, affirmed this very thing when he said these words in his letter, 1 Peter 3.15, he said, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. See, part of putting on these boots is readying yourself to share this gospel with others. Here's a couple of ways you could do that. Wear your battle ready shirt or your battle ready bracelet and listen. At some point, somebody's gonna say, hey, I like your shirt, I like your bracelet. And that's your cue in your mind to be ready to ask, can I tell you what it means? Here's another way. You know, when you're, when you're out to lunch with your coworkers or catching up with a friend or, or sitting in the barber's chair and they ask you, so do you have big plans for the weekend? Instead of jumping right into small talk about all the fun things to do in Southern California, tell people, well, I'm going to church this Sunday. And then tell them why you go to church and then tell them about Sunrise Church, and then tell them why you love Sunrise Church, 
and then invite them to come with you to attend Sunrise Church. And then you actually have to show up the next Sunday and make sure you're there when they visit. Here's one more way. Be looking for people who open up a small window of their heart to you, people who are just a little bit vulnerable to you. Maybe they share something personal like their struggle raising a teenager or uh, some struggle with their body image or a struggle with a, a bad habit. What they're doing right now is they're sticking their toe in the water. That's their subtle way of asking you for help. And this ought to be your opportunity to share with them the good news of Jesus Christ in a way that is humble and sincere. Part of putting on the boots of peace is being ready to share the good news that peace with God is possible through Jesus. This is what it means to take the offensive, to move forward, to carry forward the good news. You know, last Sunday, I was walking around before the worship service, both before and after chatting with people as I normally do. And I heard a phrase repeat a couple of times and it got my attention, it got me to thinking. I heard it stated uh, several ways, but I would ask somebody how they were doing and their answer would be, I'm good now that I'm at church. I feel peace here. And I love that. I, I hope that people experience peace with God as a result of attending Sunrise Church. I want you to love your church. I want you to be proud of your church. I want you to be confident to invite guests to your church. But I also want to warn us of something as well. We have to be careful that we don't fall into the trap of believing that peace is a location. You see, when I put on the boots of peace, I take peace with me wherever I go. You know, when I was 14 years old, I went on my first missions trip. My little church youth group in New Jersey went to the impoverished area of the Appalachian Mountains in West Virginia to distribute clothes to people in need as a means of opening the door to sharing the gospel. And so before we left, we received clothing donations from the church, and part of what we needed to do was to sort these clothes to make sure that they were presentable. And because I was an idiot teenager who didn't know anything about anything, I made fun of many of these clothes that were being donated. You know, I'd pick them up and go, oh, look at this ratty shirt. Who would wear this thing? And I'll never forget, I came across the ugliest pair of shoes I've ever seen. They were these pink high top Reeboks. I mean, they had these giant soles on them and this big gaudy tongue. I mean, they looked so odd. I remember thinking, of course somebody donated these. Look how terrible they are. Well, fast forward, we, we get to West Virginia and it's a very mountainous area. And on one of the days in which we were doing clothing distribution, from the parking lot of the church, the pastor pointed up the side of the mountain and said, you see that trailer all the way up there? We ought to bring clothes to those people. But here's the thing, we could drive there and it would take about an hour because the roads uh, wind all the way around. He goes, but I bet some of you can hike up that mountain and be up there in about 10 minutes. So me and some of the other guys saw this as a challenge. So we put the bags of clothes over our shoulders and we hiked up the side of this mountain and they were filled with sharp rocks and broken beer bottles. But we got up there in about 15 minutes and we got up to this trailer and knocked on the door and said, hey, we're, we're from the church down the hill and, and we're just trying to share the love of Jesus by, by offering some clothes if you're interested. And so this dad and his daughters began rummaging through the piles of clothes that we brought. And this teenage girl saw those ugly pink high top Reeboks and she pulled those right out and her eyes lit up. These things are probably two or three sizes too big for her feet, but she fell in love with them. I'm like, really? Those ugly things? Hey, if you want them, they're all yours. A couple of days later, it was Sunday and we were worshiping here in this local church in West Virginia. And I'll never forget looking back and seeing that teenage girl come to church for the first time wearing those pink shoes. And that's when I learned that her family was so poor and her shoes were so worn down, it was basically like walking around barefoot. But now that she had these new shoes with the thick soles, she was able to hike down the mountain 
and come to church. Those ugly shoes made it possible for her to attend church. But more importantly, those ugly shoes allowed her to bring church back to her family. The Apostle Paul said this in Romans 10, 15, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. When you and I put on the boots of peace, when our feet are fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace, when we're sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with others, our feet are declared as beautiful. Now, how many of you are just so grossed out by feet? <laughs> I get it. Feet can be nasty. Some of you have corns on your feet. Some of you have bunions on your feet. Some of you have had toes removed off your feet. Some of you have more hair on your feet than you do on your head. Listen, I get it. Feet can be gross, but I want you to do this right now. Look down at your feet. When you bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to others, those nasty feet of yours are called beautiful. You see, peace is not a location. We bring peace with us wherever we go when our feet are fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Friends, the Apostle Paul said that the way to wage war on the enemy was by waging peace. Those, those terms seem contradictory but not so when you understand this important truth. When you are at peace with God, you are at war with the devil. But when you are at peace with the devil, you are at war with God. And right now, some of you who are watching and listening to this message are just a little too at peace with the devil in your life. Some of you have grown very comfortable with things in your life that ought to convict you, that ought to disgust you, things that are evil, things that are harmful, things that are hurting you and hurting others, and they need to go. And maybe in this moment, God has opened a small window into your heart and he's whispering to you right now. He's saying to you, you know that the thing you are missing in your life is peace with God. All of these other things you have, they're not fulfilling you. What you're doing is not working. It's time to make a change. It's time to invite Jesus into your life. Today, you have an opportunity to invite into your life the only one who will bring you peace with God and that is placing your faith in Jesus Christ. Have you ever intentionally invited Christ into your life? If you haven't done that, in just a moment, I wanna help you do that. I, I wanna lead you in a simple prayer. Sometimes we call it the sinner's prayer or the salvation prayer. And, and it begins with just saying, God, I can't save myself. My sins separate me from you. But God, I I'm, I'm, I'm asking you today to come into my life, to close that gap, to forgive me of my sins, to bring me peace with God, to change me. And so I wanna help you pray this prayer. In fact, I'll even give you the words that you could repeat after me. I'll tell you what to say, but you have to take these words, make them your own, and believe them in faith. So if you're ready to invite Jesus into your life right now and have peace with God, then I want you to stop whatever it is that you're doing and lift up this prayer to heaven. Repeat after me as we pray. Jesus, today I invite you into my life. Wherever you're watching this or listening to this, you stop, you pray these words right back to him. Jesus, today I invite you into my life. I believe you died on the cross for someone like me. You paid for my sins. I should have paid for them. Thank you, Jesus. Will you forgive me? 
Will you begin a relationship with me? Will you give me peace with God? Change my heart from the inside out so that I could leave my old life behind and walk with you the rest of my days. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. So if you prayed this prayer and genuinely meant it today, then we wanna know about it. We wanna celebrate with you. We wanna pray for you. So if you're watching this on our online campus at sunrisechurch.org, click on the little button that says, I commit my life to Christ. All of our social channels, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, be bold, write in the comments, today I commit my life to Jesus. Again, Church Online, you click on those hands, get the little hands up so that we could celebrate with you. For those of you who've trusted in Christ already, but you're not moving forward, you're ready to take that next step, here's how to do it. Grab your phone right now and text the word NEXT to 909-281-7797. One of our staff people is on the other end of that text message. They're ready to receive that and begin a dialogue with you to help you take that next step in your walk with Christ. Maybe that's joining a small group or serving in the church or just meeting with someone to talk about your faith. Take that next step right now. Text NEXT to 909-281-7797. Friends, remember, when you are at peace with God, you are at war with the devil. And in order to fight a spiritual war, we need spiritual weapons. So this week, let's strap on the boots of peace and take the fight to the enemy. Let's receive God's peace. This is our starting point, faith in Jesus Christ. Make sure that you have peace with God today. And let's remember God's peace. Once you have peace with God, you have peace of God at work in your life. So do what it takes this week to remind yourself of key truths about God that can protect your heart and keep you in perfect peace. And let's relay God's peace. Let's carry it forward. This week, let's put on the boots of peace so that we could stand our ground and carry it forward, being ready to share the good news of Jesus Christ wherever we may go. Amen? Amen.